and then these, um, that, that have to come up. Two, test, oh, test, test. Okay. Awesome. I think with these mics, you got to kind of hold them close. Check. Check. Oh, okay. Yeah, much closer than I was expecting. Yeah, right. if you hold them way down here. So. Right. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody asked about them. Well, he asked yes, I just asked you. Okay. I know I can count on you. A step? No. Uh, okay. No. Somebody was asking about like a oh, okay. step stool. Oh, to get but I don't know up on the stage? Is that what you want? Is a stair? They said a step stool, and I was like, oh. Do you have a stool? I do have a stair. That would be great. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Hello. Okay, welcome everyone to the 18th annual Celebrate Invention at the University of Michigan. I'm Kelly Sexton. I'm the Associate Vice President for Research, Technology Transfer, and Innovation Partnerships, and I'm so glad that you're all here. Um, for today, we're going to kick things off by hearing um, from the University of Michigan Distinguished University Innovator of the Year, Professor Mingyan Liu, immediately followed by a panel discussion on data science commercialization. Then at 2 o'clock, um, we're going to be hosting the Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Director Andre Yanku, um, who's going to talk to us about the importance of American innovation, followed as well by a panel discussion. So glad everyone's here. Thank you for coming out. It's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker and to kick off this afternoon. Last year, the University of Michigan had over $1.5 billion in research activities across our campus and 1,360 different researchers engaged in technology transfer activity. So at a place this size, you can imagine when we put out a call and ask to identify the single innovator who best embodies the ideal University of Michigan researcher, there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of names um, that are tossed into the hat. It was really heartening to see one person rise to immediately to the top of this list. And what I've admired most about Dr. Mingyan Liu is that she really envisioned an entirely new way of thinking at a, about a problem. She took an industry, cybersecurity, that's really been focused on plugging holes and fixing breaches and thought a way, about a way to view things at the enterprise level. She tested this out in the laboratory and then decided to take it out into the broader world, launching Quadmetrics, a U of M startup company, to take it into commercial practice. Ming Yan led Quadmetrics from launch to successful acquisition in under 24 months, which was a record among U of M startup companies. So it's my distinct and pleasure, pleasure to welcome to the stage Professor Ming Yan Liu, Peter and Evelyn Fuss Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and our 2018 Distinguished University Innovator. Thank you, Mignan. Thank you, Kelly, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I am incredibly honored to be here to get this award and to have this opportunity to share with you a bit of my startup experience. Uh, let me start by saying a bit of what we invented. Um, we built the world's first enterprise cybersecurity ratings system using the technology we developed here at the university on data breach prediction. Each of you here as an adult, you probably all have a consumer credit rating score um, that captures your individual delinquency default rate. Uh, what we built, and the, this uh, individual consumer credit rating is used in every time you apply for a credit card, you apply for a mortgage, and other types of loans. What we built is essentially an analog of that, but for organizations and companies that captures their risk of suffering a material data breach. Indeed, many of you here probably have a FICO score, that captures that risk, individual risk, that shows up on some of your uh, credit card statements. The technology we have built is now a key ingredient underlying a parallel product um, at FICO called Enterprise Cybersecurity Score. So that's what we built. The technology is now used in a variety of B2B applications, uh, including bank lending, vendor management, in addition to enterprise risk management, the idea being that cyber risk is becoming a very key component of a whole list of other risk factors in making this type of business decisions. Another fast-growing area that we, our technology is contributing to is the underwriting of cyber insurance policies, a fast-growing area with premiums projected to reach uh, to exceed $10 billion by the year 2020. And what we did was basically providing the key missing piece of actuarial data that the industry does not have. Um, let me then step back uh, and say a bit about my um, background and how I got here. 
Uh, my, I was trained in applied probabilities, stochastic systems, with most of the applications in communication networks. For the first 10 to 15 years of my academic career here, I did a lot of work in mobile wireless networks. Most of my work is done by in pen and paper. We almost never develop hardware or software. We run simulations from time to time. Um, so it is uh, a bit of a surprise uh, that I am standing here. Um, I actually never seriously thought that entrepreneurship was on the horizon for me. And if you haven't noticed, our eventual invention had to do with cybersecurity, uh, data, machine learning, and I was not an expert in it either of these areas. So how did we get here? It was data. So I had these, um, back around 2012, 2013, I had these colleagues who specialized in internet measurement. They were collecting various kinds of data that basically capture who's sending out spam, who's running phishing campaigns, how are internet hosts, these devices configured, what are the issues. So they have a huge amount of data. Now, a lot of my work up to that point had been around building mathematical models to capture network systems. So these colleagues came to me uh, asking whether I could build fancier models using the data. But when I saw the data, I decided I wanted, I'm, I was really interested in something different. I wasn't really interested in building models that capture the device level behavior. What I was really interested in is how can I take these device level data to capture and characterize the risks of an entire organization. That's what I was really interested in. And why is that? I think there are two, three reasons. One is my background. Uh, I was not trained in system level cybersecurity, so the host level, device level data didn't appeal to me as much. I was trained in systems. I was used to dealing with entire networks. So it was kind of natural for me to want to know what happens at a higher level. That was one. Two, I had this belief that when you look at system at a macroscopic level, then you tend to find things that are more predict predictable. In this particular context, uh, organizationally speaking, policy change, personnel change occur on a much slower time scale uh, than software updates, patches, uh, and, and installation. And this consistency uh, is what we hope to give us predictability. And once we understand predictability, we can begin to think about techniques that are proactive and preventative in nature. And that's a very different approach to the standard of the time, which was a lot of detection-based cybersecurity approaches. And I'll say a last reason that I was interested in this macroscopic level view is that I was interested in designing policies, in particular incentive policies. It was interested in knowing what kind of policies can we construct that would incentivize more responsible and more effective organizational st strategic making. Right? Questions like, should I spend money on personnel training? Should I spend money on uh, software upgrade? Or should we spend money on two-factor? Apparently we are. So that, those were the ideas driving me. Um, it was a good vision, but my students and I had a lot of failed attempts. Um, what happened was essentially we were trying to come up with metrics, capturing organizational cyber risk. And the data we had were very heterogeneous. Uh, they were collected by different entities for capturing different aspects of the system. So when you try to uh, come to try to summarize all this very different uh, data types and arguing and trying to demonstrate one way of summarizing it is superior to another, uh, it can appear arbitrary. We did a lot of unsupervised exercise using the data we had, and we had a lot of interesting observations along the way, um, but we couldn't get our papers accepted. Um, the, the review we keep coming, keeps coming back uh, to us. A typical review is, so what? And we were stuck in this mode for at least two years. We had at least four to five uh, paper submissions rejected. Uh, my senior student working on this project, he was getting very, very desperate. 
Right in the middle of this, around 2014, I think it's about the time when we started seeing high-profile data breaches uh, being publicized, and they appear in media and getting more attention. Um, around that time, for instance, we had Target, Sony, J.P. Morgan Chase, Home Depot. By the way, do we even remember them? There have been so many afterwards. Yahoo, Equifax, Facebook each one bigger than the, the, the previous one, right? There's a clear upward trend, and they were costing more. Data suggests that between 2010 and 2014, there was a 95% increase in the average cost of an incident. But as this was happening, as these breaches were getting more, uh, more publicity, they were getting reported more consistently and more widely. And that eventually gave us the following idea, which was, can we take these breach reports and use them as labels to perform supervised learning? For those who, who, among you who are not familiar with the concept, essentially that basically says, let's take these device level data that we have, observa observational data, and pair them up with these breach reports. Okay, so now you have entities who have a known breach report, entities who don't. This can allow us to essentially train what's called a classifier or predictor that can help us forecast data breaches. And that's essentially what we did. The exercise turned out to be very, very non-trivial just because the data are so different and they are completely misaligned in time and in space and we had to do a lot of processing. But the end result was successful. And yes, we answered the so what question and our paper was accepted uh, in 2015. And commercial success followed uh, our startup company, Quadmetrics. Uh, we built that using this as a T technology, um, and it was acquired two years later by FICO. Um, in hindsight, I think uh, what we did, the technology we developed captured not just the uh, cybersecurity conditions of the individual devices within a, uh, within a network or organization, the methodology actually captured a lot of human elements behind that. Um, policy issues, um, governing data access, sharing, procurement, the adequacy of the IT team and security spending. And I think that's one key reason why our technology worked, because fundamentally cybersecurity is as much a, is as much a human problem as it is a technological problem. And finally, um, this technology development actually allowed me to come full circle. Uh, remember, one of the reasons I got into this was because I was interested in policy design. Using this type of cyber quantifica risk quantification, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. Uh, let me end this uh, with a few personal takeaways from this startup experience. Uh, I think it did a lot of things quite differently, but one thing I followed, conventional wisdom, People will always tell you, if you're going to do a startup, do it with the person you can trust your kids with. I did it with my husband. <laughs> um, we had two kids, aged seven and two at a time. Uh, so this turned out to be a major challenge, logistical challenge um, that we had to deal with. Um, both our families, uh, closest family members, lived halfway around the world on the other side. And so what that meant was um, for child care responsibility reasons, uh, one of us had to basically opt out of a lot of the critical meetings. But in hindsight, looking back, I would say that running a startup with young kids uh, had its benefits. It um, gives one some serious uh, perspectives on what is life, what is work, and what's important. It's not work. Um, and it forced us to have downtime uh, and forced us to be really uh, focused and prioritized on what's really essential. And some of the clearest thinkings occurred during one of these downtimes, sitting through play dates or standing on the sidelines of, uh, of a soccer game. Um, another thing is, as a startup, we, if, we ultimately did not go the VC route uh, for a number of reasons. One big reason is I think I'm a, a typical academic. I quickly realized that I was interested in innovation and technology de development on this side. I was also very interested in technology adoption. But I was not interested in anything in between. 
which is a lot. It includes product development, human resource, sales, marketing, legal, everything. It's a huge distance. But one of the benefits of being an academic, being at a university like Michigan, is that we do have a lot of other sources of funding, some of which can be completely sufficient to see us through a uh, development cycle. I know the university and a lot of academic units on this campus are working in earnest to uh, provide better support for transition activities. I think that's one of the reasons why we're here today. Um, and on that note, uh, I would say that all of this would not have been possible without research funding support that I received from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, my program manager really took a chance uh, with my project. I submitted the original proposal, not on the startup, but on the idea of building this global rating system back in 2012. He had been sitting on it for over a year. He had the money, he was tempted, but he wasn't sure about the direction we were going. And I remember distinctly a phone call I had with him in 2013. He said, Min Yan, are you sure this is the right direction to go? Because it was an unconventional idea. Okay. Um, I assured him with as much confidence as I could find. Um, but the truth is, who could know it was really going to work? It did take us more than two years to actually get our feet first paper accepted by the community. Uh, he really took a risk on a very unconventional idea, and then for that I'm very grateful. I will end this by saying that data science has reached a level of maturity to enable what I consider to be two different strands of innovation. One is this continuing to push for the frontiers of more capable, more powerful, data science and machine learning tools. But there's the second uh, strand of research and innovation, and that is in using existing tools to identify new problems to solve and identify new problem uh, solution space. There are a lot, this is particularly true in domains where the acquisition and availability of data is a, re a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. In these areas, I think a lot of um, um, problems are, are ripe for disruption with new data-driven approaches. My own experience, I think, is an example of that, uh, that even equipped with relatively standard machine learning tools, we can take on opportunities by conceptualizing new problems and solution spaces. So thank you, and let's celebrate invention. I will now welcome the panel moderator to bed. Okay, have our panelists come on up and join me up here, otherwise you're gonna hear me talk and that'll be less interesting. So thank you everybody for taking some time out of your day to uh, spend time with this panel. My name is Drew Bennett. I'm with the Office of Technology Transfer and I work with the licensing team and uh, specifically I work on the, the software side of our business. Um, today, uh, along with uh, Dr. Liu, we are joined by three other folks that I've had the good opportunity to work with on a variety of different things and hopefully they're gonna all provide some unique insights on uh, big data commercialization and data science. So in preparation of the panel, I always like to go out and look at what the latest and greatest statistics are that are being touted for one thing or another. And uh, a couple of things that I think are always interesting to understand is what um, industry is looking at as far as when they're trying to scope, how big is this? Because I think as much as we all appreciate uh, data science and data commercialization, is a significant marketplace and growing, sometimes an uh, independent or objective uh, measure is worthy of uh, some consideration. So according to uh, Forrester, predicts that the global big data software, data science software market will be worth $31 billion this year, growing 14% from the previous year, 
and the entire global software market is forecast to be worth 60 or $628 billion, or $62.8 billion in revenue, with $302 billion of that from applications. And according to an Accenture study, which I think is pretty indicative of where the stakes are, 79% of all enterprise executives agree that companies that do not embrace data science and big data will lose their competitive position and could face elimination. Uh, very interesting statistics. So I'm going to let the panel uh, introduce themselves. Uh, I have to give a special uh, recognition to Dr. Levieri, who told me when I invited her to be on the panel, she said, Drew, I'm willing to do that, but you got to understand I'm right about to be entering motherhood, so know that's a risk you're going to take, so I'm very happy she's here. I was sweating it a little earlier, but she made it, so if we can each introduce ourselves, that would be great. Okay, uh, my name is Mariela Vieri, and I'm in the School of Industrial and Operations Engineering. Um, I would say my work is uh, data science, and uh, it's most, my work is mostly of sequential decision making, but over time I've realized that data plays a big role in those sequential decisions, and that's how I ended up with data science. So it's a linkage between sequential decision making and data sciences. Mostly my work is applied to medical decision making and personalized medicine. And my name is Michael Burns. Um, I'm an MD-PhD researcher in the School of uh, Medicine. I work in the anesthesiology department, so 40% of my time is spent in the operating rooms. 60% is with uh, big data and research. I work in a group called MPOG here on campus, where we accumulate um, big data, anesthesiology, <coughs> hospital-driven uh, data from over 50 different hospitals across the United States and in Europe. And um, most of what we do is uh, make the data appropriate for researchers and for other business entities. I'm Bill Stacy, also an MD PhD. I'm in the Department of Neurology and in Biomedical Engineering. And I am an epilepsy physician. And my uh, research goal and clinical goal is to try and implement big data tools to analyze the EEG waves. Um, people have been looking at them basically like pictures for almost 100 years. And now that everything is digitized, there's a large amount of information that we have not been availing ourselves of. And uh, we've been developing algorithms to try and uh, process these things and then uh, finding ways to bring it back to clinicians so that they can interpret them in these scenarios. Dr. Will you introduce yourself at the outset, so we'll get on with the questions. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Bill. In your experience, what do you think are some of the most promising areas that data science and data commercialization will help solve in the next five to ten years? So I, I see things a little bit differently than, than most of the medical field with data science. Um, the, probably the, the overwhelming majority when uh, in the medical field, what they're talking about is processing all of the different types of data to look for connections of things. So if you look at the sex and the medications and the different comorbidities that a patient has, you try to line all of these things up and come up with some type of risk profile, something that insurance has been doing for a long time and now uh, physicians are trying to do. That's not what I'm interested in. Uh, plenty of people doing that. Uh, we, co we acquire a lot of actual clinical data, if you think of what an MRI scan does. Every one of those pictures is a large amount of data. I look at EEG, and we'll have 100 channels that are recording continually for days. And uh, we have a patient in the hospital right now, and this patient will hopefully give me a terabyte of data. And I've got 60 patients so far. So what do I do with 60 terabytes of data? I have to find a way to process this stuff, and, and what people have been doing is processing it visually. Uh, it's a bit of a sweatshop approach where uh, postdocs, not in my lab, will sit and uh, to analyze 10 minutes of data will take them four hours. Well, I want to analyze a week of data, and obviously I don't have enough postdocs to do that, so I needed some way to analyze large amounts of data and then interpret it. 
So that is now, when you think of genetics, imaging, and then many of the electrophysiological study, studies that we're doing in medicine, there is just vast amounts of information coming in. It's analogous to what we're seeing in all, all fields. So there's just so much data available all the time. And you can do, uh, you can look for these correlation analyses, which is what most people are doing. But the other thing is actually looking at the data itself and try to see uh, what signs and signals are there inside of that data that no one has been able to see before because the data were not available and the tools were not available to process it. Anybody else want to answer that? This is kind of my, my favorite question is what do you think is going to get, get uh, changed? So I'm, I'm open this up to everybody to give us their thoughts. Sure. Um, so uh, the project that I'm involved with that actually introduced me to Drew was a um, billing problem that we had within MPOG. I think the, to answer the question before I kind of go off on a tangent, is the, I think the low-hanging fruit is the, the first thing everyone should go after, the ones that are going to be most successful, the places in which you can automate things that maybe necessarily shouldn't be a, um, a person doing the work, and I think machine learning can help tremendously in those areas. So the project that, um, that brought me to Drew was um, in anesthesiology. We primarily code one way for reimbursement. We use CPT codes, and the way that we gather the data, we end up getting EHR data directly from institutions, and we get the billing code from their billing departments, but there's a lag time, typically of a month or two, as the billing departments have to process the data in order to submit their bills, and then they end up coming to us. We use the billing data for research purposes to categorize um, the cases and the patients. And therefore, we had a month or two lag behind using that data for research studies. Or the research studies that use this data would end up um, being altered, you know, close <coughs> to submissions. So we, we saw this as a pretty big problem. The other um, utility for CPT codes within our work is we, um, part of the arm of MPOG is quality metrics. We give providers real-time feedback for how they did in the operating room, meeting criteria. And as of now, there's um, exclusion and inclusion criteria based on the CPT codes, which would end up leading to a month or two month delay. And I'm one of these providers that gets feedback, and I can't remember the cases that well two months ago. So what we wanted to do was automate a process. So we created, using natural language processing and machine learning, we now get the codes and in real time, or I'm sorry, we get the, um, the EHR data and in real time we have a, a billing code. So as soon as they upload, we can bill it. And then we went to, so we thought that this is really useful for us, is it useful for the billing department? So we went to the University of Michigan billing department and we said, well, what's your current process? And just like everyone else, there's a month or two lag. And um, they had just run a year audit on six of the 300 potential codes and found that they were missing out on about $85,000 in revenue by undercoding. We said, this is great. We'll take all your data and we'll run it through the machine instead of six codes, we'll do it for all 300. And they said, sure, how long will that take? And I said, probably like 10 minutes. And so <laughs> we ended up running the whole um, uh, process through. And um, I said, well, what's your current auditing um, strategy? They said, we don't have one. So there's a six month lag time in which you can resubmit codes. And they weren't utilizing that. So the underbilling was just perpetuated through all of the coding. So we did this. And through a month of um, the first month, they found about 200 base units, which are about $50 a piece. And then the next month we found about 380 base units and instantly they started resubmitting. So now we're working with them as an auditing tool. So I, I, figure, I, I see that as kind of a, a low hanging fruit. There was no auditing process. The machine can look through all of the codes. We can process 10 million codes in, in a matter of an hour. And then we can give you a list of where there's discrepancies. This is what you build for. This is what the machine says you should have billed for, and here are the big base unit corrections based on the frequency of these codes being changed and also the, the base unit differences, which is how you, how you get reimbursed. So I think things like that, it, it's really powerful because um, there, there's revenue to be had, and it's, it's easy to see that if we put this into a builder's workflow, we can take the very easy units that no one should really be looking at and redistributing the the personnel to be processing the very difficult units. And then hopefully as a, as a whole, um, the department's uh, recouping the money it should be getting in the first place. 
So I guess I can give a little bit more of my background and say what I see, some of the potential future. And for me, I don't see that as sciences as uh, taking the human out of the picture, because there's still a lot of uh, subjective information that's hard to include in data science. Rather, I see it as a complement and a way of guiding decision making. And again, my side is decision making, that's my interest. So for me, I would say I work a lot with chronic diseases. I work in cancer, I work in cardiovascular, long lasting diseases where you will be making many decisions. I work in the eye, that's how I work with you. Part of the eye, I'm still learning about different parts of the eye, but uh, some parts. Uh, so at this point, mostly glaucoma, but hoping to get into other areas. And uh, the way we work is mostly. If you have a great clinician and he knows everything and there are some, some options, then you, data science can still reassure you, but it may not be as useful as if you go to rural regions where clinicians may not have access to all of that training or all of that information. So a big part of what we do is thinking, well, how can we guide this so that regardless of where you go for care, you would still have access to top quality care by using some of the tools we create. So that's part of the stuff uh, that we work on. Decisions that we may guide is, for example, not every patient needs the same type of treatment. Not every patient may need the same amount of uh, monitoring. Some patients may be able to wait a little bit longer between uh, monitoring. Some patients may be able to wait less. And uh, a lot of the solutions we come up with would be solutions that give you a range of ideas of what you can do, where they even, regardless of who the clinician is, still would have to impart that uh, qualitative uh, knowledge to be able to provide information. So a big part of what I see the future is still being able to combine the quantitative power of data science with the qualitative knowledge that, in my case, clinicians, but in other cases of data sciences, experts in the field, you still need human beings in it. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I already talked about what uh, some of the things we did with data. Um, I, will, I will mention two areas, I think, um, actually, uh, I, I'm not an expert in either, but I'll, I'll just mention them, where I see um, perhaps potentially a great impact and disruption by data in computational sciences. I think one is in natural sciences, so these data-driven and computationally driven approaches to discovering, let's say, new material, new phenomena. The other one is perhaps slightly darker, um, which is I think it's, we're already in the middle of this, uh, but in a, in a not very uh, too distant future, um, the, our individual behavior is going to be increasingly uh, analyzed um, and, and used for a variety of uh, things. Uh, we get uh, targeted advertising of all kinds of things. Some are our opinions, some are our products that we may uh, consume. Uh, I think we're going to see an increasing um, use of personal data um, for this type of purposes, and that's going. And that I think um, it's it, it will um, lead to a lot of uh, security and privacy uh, issues as well as um, trust. Um, so it's something I want to put it out there. I think it's something we as individual consumers should all be aware of that we all our data are now out there. You know, this thing, giant machine, knows plenty about us. Um, and it's going to use it to feed into many more obscure things we don't immediately see. And um, so it's I think it's, it's <coughs> something that the you know the data science community and the people working in these areas uh, should Try to be proactive about that. Great. Which I, I think you can never really have a conversation about data commercialization or big data without having that conversation, which is privacy and security are usually the fast follower after I say, well, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then usually somebody uh, becomes very interested very quickly in this trove of data that exists and how it can be used. I think. Um, in the most basic sense, the question is, how do we as academics, and researchers, and ultimately industry start to affect a change in that conversation and try to manage those elements of balancing privacy and security with the benefits that you just described in some of the projects that you're doing? So I'll let anybody who wants to take that one. Uh, 
uh, try and give their thoughts on it. So one it's I a would, hot question, I know, always, right? <laughs> Security. So I would say one part is uh, if you know what the data will be used for, you may know which data is actually needed and which data may not be needed to be collected. So in terms of decision making, if the data is not going to impact the decision, you may not need to be collecting that data for patients or for whatever decision you're making. But I would say this is a funny question for me because uh, I was just, uh, before this semester, I was in London for some time. Uh, and they've had the similar discussions there about uh, privacy. They have a lot of information about patients because it's a centralized system versus here, or much more centralized than what we have. Yet still, they, they, don't, they cannot use it for decision making, which was, was interesting to say. So it's something I would say is a global problem, not just here. Do you think it's something where you essentially have to change the dynamic where going back to the general consumer that they're just essentially going to have to have better controls about saying I'm in or out, whereas right now it seems to be the general opinion is it's fairly obscure as to, I don't know what Facebook's getting at me or I don't know what uh, Google or anybody else as far as a general consumer is concerned. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Well, I, the data that we work with, it seems like all three of us, all four of us up here is, the, is um, under HIPAA, so we we go over and above. Our, all of my data sets are clean, and then we still have them on HIPAA servers, and we still will use them in-house. So we go a little bit extreme. The other side of the pendulum, I think, is with the social um, networks. I mean, I think anything I do on my phone automatically gets tracked. Any update that we do, it's an opt-in instead of an opt-out. And I don't know, it's a little scary. You're mentioning it's, a, it's kind of a, a dark art, and I agree with it. Like, there are things that, um, you know, if you ever go through the app function and find out who has what, uh, what privacy controls, you'll find that all sorts of things that, um, you know, why do they need to know your contacts or use your camera when it's maybe a stock app or who knows. But uh, they do it, they want the data, and then ultimately I'm assuming some of them sell it, some of them use it to you know, sell you more products, and that's kind of scary, because uh, in some ways it's a lot more personable and personal and useful information than your healthcare information. So, in the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence and deep learning and this various things, and I'm going to ask you, Dr. Stacy, to comment on this, you know, how do, how do we have confidence or how do we... Uh, think about confidence in what the machine is doing and ensure that that process uh, has the appropriate transparency and continued human engagement to make it better. Yeah, so this is very close to my heart. Um, so I mentioned before that, that what people in my field have been doing is visualizing things. So they, they look at a bunch of pictures, they look at the person's MRI, they look at the clinical scenario, they look at the EEG, and then you, you get this gestalt of, of what you think you should do having put all of that information together. And, and there's many things. There's other things I didn't even mention. And then to take a machine learning approach that's going to spit on an answer without telling you how that answer was obtained is ridiculous. So a, a clinician is not going to accept that, or they should not. I'm actually more afraid that they might. Because the, the answer will always, there will always be an answer. And I've seen this as, as we were working on our algorithms. There, there's always an answer. And if you think of the, the types of artificial intelligence, machine learning things that we accept. So we've got an autonomous car driving around the NCRC right now, the M City. And there's a person sitting there with an iPad just to make sure the car never does anything ridiculous. Now, it probably hasn't yet, but there are some, maybe it happens, I don't know, but there, there probably are some situations that it's not ready for, and who knows what it's going to do. And it's going to give an answer, and the more deep learning you go, the less you're going to know how they've arrived at that answer. And so there's never this feat. And one thing that, that we had to do in our algorithm is that the, the people in the past have been doing this black box approach where they say, you give me your data and I will go in my dark room and I'm going to find an answer and then I'll come back and, and this is your answer. 
and it's not done very uh, rigorously and the, the person making the decision has no idea how that decision was made. And there's been a lot of reluctance to accept that. Uh, and what the clinicians have been saying is you have to show me a clinical trial that shows that it works. Um, if there were a trial, I, I hope that the clinicians wouldn't accept that answer because you need, you need to have a little bit of feedback. And that's uh, when, when I hear people getting all excited about deep learning, that it, it is a little bit scary because you don't have any idea how the answer was determined. You don't have any way of going back and figuring out any failure modes that might have happened. And you won't even know when you failed until there's a catastrophe. Uh, the, the machine learning field, they have a lot of safeguards. Um, but just like in the security field, you know, every, every company that has told you everything is perfectly safe, they're the ones that get attacked first. So I, I take a bit of a pessimistic attitude to it. It's just what happens. So there, there will be failures, and you have to be ready to figure out how that happens. So I, I, I really don't like the black box approach. There's got to be some feedback. We're getting a little feedback that we need to be louder, so I guess we'll try and accommodate that if we can. So I think uh, I, I, I'd like to add to that. I think uh, as, as users and consumers of some of these products, it's, it's good for us to continue to push for transparency uh, and interpretability from these algorithms, which I think will help uh, us understand better uh, what data is being used and why we're getting the results we're getting. So I completely agree. I think um, we need to do better than the black box approach. I think the uh, machine learning community is uh, getting into a few of these areas. One is the fairness of these uh, algorithms. We want to make sure that different uh, groups are equally protected in terms of the accuracy and error of these uh, machine learning algorithms. The other is this feedback approach, which is to look at if you really are going to take these machine learning outputs in your, embed them in your decision making process, what is going to happen next? And take that into this feedback loop, try to design better algorithms. One prime example is face recognition. It's not known that uh, depending on how you train the uh, face uh, recognition algorithm, it, it can be very good in recognizing um, certain demographic groups, their faces, but can be terrible in a different demographic group. And if you use this, then you can lead to, you can get into a situation where uh, those uh, face higher error rates will start to lead the system, they will stop using it, uh, which can further lead to the algorithms being even more inaccurate for, for those groups. So we're starting to see research in these areas, and hopefully um, they will push uh, for these algorithms to become fairer, more transparent, more interpretable, more accurate. I guess I can say one thing. I teach a class, a PhD, master class, uh, in my department about healthcare and the models that created for them. And uh, the students go there thinking the first class is going to be math. And usually the, my first class is we read a paper about, all the other classes are math, but the first class is uh, what can you teach, um, what can engineers, uh, industrial engineers in that case, uh, teach clinicians and they can always brainstorm tons of stuff that we can do for them. And then I ask them, like, what can clinicians teach us? And that's usually, it gets quiet. <laughs> usually uh, as a first class we're expecting again math. So, and that's a part where I think that can make talking about your black box, uh, if, the, if the people creating it start thinking about the fact that it's not just you creating something for others, but mm -hmm. others putting input into it, that can help somehow diminish a little bit the black box effect. Yeah, so I just want to mention, interpretability I think is everything. Um, it's really hard to believe a model, especially, I mean, go back to healthcare because that's where I work, but if you if you tell me an answer and I can't really decide how you came upon the answer itself, it, it's hard for me to believe it. And um, I'll give one example. There's sepsis models. So sepsis is like a blood infection. Usually people end up in the ICU. There's many ways to, to treat it. Usually you treat the underlying cause, which could be a myriad of things. There are machine learning models. There's no less than five that I've read about thus far. 
and some of them have actually been um, implemented in some hospitals, and they're about 60% accurate. The problem is um, the initial treatment of sepsis is antibiotics and fluid, and if there's a different cause, you flood the patient with fluid, and you end up overloading their lungs, and you can give them heart failure and kill them. So it's a huge risk for a reward in which the underlying um, label that the gold standard isn't really well identified. So if you ask three physicians to define sepsis, I think you can get three different answers. So it's, it's a pretty tough thing to, to shoot for. And it's scary because um, I think someone up here was mentioning early implementation. I'm not sure healthcare should be the, the one of the founders of that. I think we should take the time to do things a little differently. But interpretability, if, if it's just a, a black box, you'll never get to that answer. Uh, we try to tease things out. We take some of the math and um, build a couple things on our own to help with interpretation. This is just with the billing side of it. The billing side of it isn't going to kill anyone. So I think that <laughs> the future models need to, need to take that consideration for sure. Great. So I, I, in my travels around campus, I run into this uh, quote posted in a number of researchers' office. And it's uh, it, something to the effect that uh, the thing doesn't necessarily inspire me when I go, aha, at the end of the experiment, more so when I go, that's strange. Um, as a point of interest and something good coming after that, I think to that kind of that nuance there is what is the thing that you've run into through your work in data science and uh, exploration of it where you thought, man, that, that is just exactly the benefit that we're hoping to get out of it because intuitively I never would have expected that. And so kind of the, the surprise that uh, surprised and delighted you and made you happy that these tools are starting to come into the fore and, and potentially represent really good opportunities for transformation and change. So um, I think you mentioned that some of the basic machine learning models are very adequate for many of the problems. And that's what I, that was the aha moment I had. I thought, geez, I'm gonna, about four years ago I got machine learning and I really started you know, opening up books and taking courses and trying to learn all of this uh, the hard science. And um, my first implementation of the machine learning models, I, I started with something simple, random forests, and then I went from reinforce SVM and from SVM to, to deep learning models and neural nets and so on and so forth. And for the problem that I was um, tackling, this is the early CPT problem, uh, they all worked the same. They all worked exactly the same. And so it was interesting because the, the math and the science behind them are distinctly different, but the problem was the same. So the majority of our efforts needed to be focused not on the machine learning side of it, but the data side of it, so the processing and the collecting and all those things. So the aha moment was, you know, within two, three lines of code, anyone can do machine learning. And you really want to, to do all the things around it to make it, you know, a better project. So I think the people that have those signs up were not data scientists. <laughs> um, because a lot of times the aha in data science is a glitch. And you don't you don't know it's a glitch. So in, when my students are making classifiers, and they find a cool little cluster of data out, the the inclination they have is to say, "Look, I've got this great cluster." I say, "Well, have you looked at those data points yet? Yeah, go back to the raw data." What I've been telling, I've got one student in particular who's notorious for this. I tell him, "Go get your hands dirty and look at the data." at those spots because you've got a classifier and it's doing its thing and it might have found something cool but it also might have found some artifact that, that means absolutely nothing and that's again the black the black box approach and there are there are cool things that come out that you can't find in the any other way but it's some 50 50 or 40 60 that, that the other side is just that that you're finding this is data, if you looked at the data on its own, you would have skipped it because it was junk. But the classifier doesn't do that, and so it's forming a little cluster off on its own of, of junk. How do you think that, you, you know, that's a really interesting question relative to education. How do we educate the students who are now, you know, the promise of the tools not being balanced with the discipline of exactly what you're saying, understand what's there, be willing to tear through it, etc. What, what do you think is the big 
push to just ensure that discipline is part of the learning process to understand how to yeah, apply them appropriately. When, when you're getting started, you have to look at the raw data. You can't, you can't just process stuff. And this probably isn't just for education, it's for any project you're doing. If, you, if you're just processing the data and looking at your output and never looking at the raw data, you're going to run into trouble. So if I might add to that, I think, I think it's very important. I would say domain expertise is very, very, very important. Um, some data scientists that I've come across, um, they, they like their data to be clean. They want it cleaned up, and now it's a sequence of numbers. They feel comfortable and say, I know what to do with these numbers. Uh, but I think in that, that they're exactly missing what um, you just heard is the what, what do the numbers mean? In different domains, they may they mean different things, and they will lead to different interpretations. So, uh, I think to our students, a solid foundation in sound domain uh, application science, I think, is very important uh, in helping them understand uh, what kind of data to use, what approach to use, how to interpret what they're doing, and getting their heads dirty. Uh, I had the same experience with my students. Uh, I think. Um, a lot of my students in particular, again, they're, they're used to uh, just writing down equations and, you know, proving theorems. They try to do the absolute minimum amount to get by, right? And occasionally, I hit upon a student who's really not afraid to just spend the time getting themselves immersed and buried in data. Uh, yes, that's how they spend 90-95% of their time, um, just getting their hands on the data, around the data. Um, but ultimately, I think that's where insights uh, and results come from. Um, to me, I would say one, one thing would be the idea that um, each new application is different, yet you also need that high-level theoretical knowledge to be able to develop them. What I mean by that is that uh, you cannot just go ahead and take a model that has been developed for cancer and just apply it to cardiovascular disease and think it's just going to work. On the other hand, some of the math that you develop in certain diseases could be applicable to others, but you need a lot of effort to translate from one to the next. And that's something that uh, sometimes people say, well, a lot of these methods have been applied to airline industry, why don't you just apply it to directly to hospital management, and you can, but it's, got, it's not as quick of a jump as you may think. The other part is, uh, talking, you were talking about the data, and uh, something I realized at one point is that we do a lot of our stuff in expectation. It should on expectation work well, and when you have large data sets, that's great, right? But uh, if you go to medicine, each of those data points is a patient. And once I started thinking about it like that, it's not just an outlier I can just take out from my models, it's a real human being that's, that's going to be impacted by the whole cycle. Fantastic. I'd like to thank all our panelists, Dr. Lou, Dr. Berry, Dr. Burns, and Dr. Stacy for being here. We're going to wrap up now so we have a chance to transition into the next panel. I would encourage everybody to attend the Translational Research uh, Fair next door and please stick around for Celebrate Invention at 3 o'clock. Thank you very much for being here.
wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Um, please take a seat. We're going to get started here. All right. Thank you, everyone. I know um, some of you were here for the last panel, but for those new faces in the room, welcome to the um, 2018 Celebrate Invention at University of Michigan. I'm Kelly Sexton, Associate Vice President for Research, Technology Transfer, and Innovation Partnerships. America's research universities are engines for creativity, discovery, and innovation. Much of this is fueled by federal research funding, um, at campuses across the U.S. last year, over $38 billion in federal R&D occurred. In order for society to realize all of the benefits of our investment in research, universities have to be able to take these research discoveries and transfer them to the entrepreneurs, the businesses, large and small. They can take these discoveries and invest the resources necessary to bring them to the marketplace where they can become the life-saving therapeutics, medical devices, diagnostics, new products and services that improve our quality of life. In order for all of this activity to occur, we absolutely rely on a strong patenting system. And that's why I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker, the director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Andre Yanku. I, like many university tech transfer leaders, have been really impressed and heartened by the actions that he's taken in his first seven months on the job to really change the dialogue about innovation and to begin to chart a policy course for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that is pro-inventor and focuses on incentivizing innovation. As director of the USPTO, Mr. Yanku provides leadership and oversight to one of the largest IP offices in the world with more than 12,000 employees and an annual budget of over $3 billion. He also serves as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Commerce on domestic and international property policy matters. Director Yanku holds a Juris Doctor from the UCLA School of Law. He also has a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering as well as a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering both from UCLA. Director Yanku, welcome to the University of Michigan. Hi, everybody. So good to see all of you here, and uh, so good to be in Michigan. Um, and thank you, uh, Kelly, for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, when I first uh, came to the Patent Office, uh, Patent and Trademark Office, or as the trademark lawyers uh, say, it's the uh, TPO, the Trademark and Patent Office. Um, Mike was uh, one of the first ones there. Where is he now? So over here. Uh, and um, from the very beginning, he said, you have to come out to Michigan. And I uh, said I would very much uh, love to come out to Michigan, and uh, I'm very, very happy to be here now. Um, it really is a pleasure to be with you here today. By the way, my daughter, who's not here, is a student at the University of Michigan and in the medical school. But... Um, Working hard, because that's what uh, you have all your students do here, I guess. Uh, so a uh, special place in my heart for this, uh, for this university. And look, it's, uh, it's, it's the amazing, among many, many other things that you do here, it's the amazing innovation that occurs on this campus and the universities around the country uh, and in this local community that uh, uh, are key drivers to, uh, to, um, to the American economy and to, uh, to this country's success. So uh, I'll talk to you a little bit, uh, just for a few minutes, about uh, the PTO and about innovation in the United States in general. And then I understand we'll be on a panel, and um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions anyone might have. But uh, to begin with, innovation is very well known, obviously, to the Detroit area. And as a result, the PTO's relationship with this region is deep and long-standing. Uh, as many of you probably know, the USPTO has had one campus in the Washington, D.C. area for hundreds of years. Uh, we've moved around a little bit, but always one campus, always in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, but uh, the USPTO opened its first regional office six years ago, and it was in the Detroit area. And it's no coincidence that we opened here our first office. Uh, it is the first ever location outside of Washington, D.C. 
And our office in Detroit offers many resources to local inventors and entrepreneurs and to the University Tech Transfer Office um, and folks here in this room. Uh, in 2018, the Detroit Regional Offices, Office held over 300 outreach programs in the region, focused on engaging in the local communities uh, among its uh, various states in intellectual property issues. Our Detroit office also frequently provides guest lectures to the University of Michigan engineering courses, among many, many other uh, activities. I'm also delighted uh, that we welcomed a new regional director to the Detroit office just a few uh, weeks ago. I don't see him here now in this room, but it is Damien Porcari who is also with us, uh, was, was supposed to be with us, he's parking the car or something, but uh, <laughs> uh, in any event, when he comes, uh, he will say hello. Uh, there he is, uh, perfect timing. Uh, that was actually planned from the beginning. <laughs> Uh, Damien is a local, uh, born and raised in the Detroit area, and before joining the USPTO, he was at Ford for the past, uh, 20, for almost 28 years. He's also volunteered in the Detroit area camp invention um, for, for some 20 years, and is also an inventor, has five, at least five patents. Damien is your direct link to the USPTO, and uh, please feel free to reach out to him at any time. Uh, that you have any, uh, any issues that you want to raise with us at the PTO. Innovation at the university level and the subsequent transfer from your laboratories to the marketplace is critically important to the American economy. In particular, for the seventh consecutive year, I understand that the University of Michigan was ranked number one among all American public universities in research and development spending by the National Science Foundation. And on the patent front, U of M inventors have already had about 170 U.S. patents granted this year alone. And I will hand deliver one actually later this afternoon, <laughs> hot off the presses. I encourage all of you to, uh, to come. The, the university's tech transfer office has also helped launch over 110 startups over the past 10 years, almost one every month on average. The innovation that occurs here is truly remarkable. One prime example is the University of Mich one prime University of Michigan success story is Dr. Arlene Simon. Dr. Simon holds a bachelor's degree in chemical and biomolecular engineering from Georgia Tech and a doctorate in macromolecular science and engineering from the University of Michigan. She was a finalist in the 2013 Collegiate Inventors Competition and was featured in the 2017 Women's History Month exhibit at the PTO. Dr. Simon invented a diagnostic test for detecting bone marrow transplant rejections in cancer patients, which requires only a finger prick of blood rather than painful invasive biopsy. She recounts her journey. She said, quote, in my third year of graduate school at the University of Michigan, my experiments failed miserably every day. At least that's what it felt like, she said. Many times I contemplated calling it quits. So what made her continue? She says it was the strong support system. Quote, my academic advisor, my postdoc mentor, my friends, my family, and my faith, close quote. She spent that year trying and trying and failing and failing until one day she realized the problem. And she says she changed her reagent and voila, success. This type of perseverance is a common trait among successful inventors. And this type of a support network that is available here at the university is a common trait for success in innovation and the reason, one of the principal reasons for success at the university. With the help of UN's, U of M's Tech Transfer Office, Dr. Simon was awarded three U.S. patents and phase one and phase two small business innovation research grants from NSF and was able to launch a biotech startup called Phasic 
to commercialize this unique technology. This is the type of inspirational innovation that the university creates. Innovation at universities in general is a critical component of America's economic growth, as I've mentioned, and the improvement of the human condition around the world. The federal government invests approximately $150 billion a year in R&D, two-thirds of which is invested at universities and industry R&D institutions, one-third of which is invested at federal laboratories. In turn, intellectual property protection is critically important to drive such innovation. Before 1980, fewer than 250 patents were issued to U.S. universities each year, and their discoveries were rarely commercialized for the, pub for the uh, benefit of the public. However, the Bayh-Dole Act and other measures stimulated an explosion in university tra tech transfer. The ability of universities to retain title and actively license these technologies presented a great incentive. The Association of University Technology Managers, also known as Autumn, reported that 7,021 new patents were issued to U.S. universities in 2016 alone. In turn, patents issued to U.S. universities resulted in 7,730 new licenses licenses and options in 2016, 1,024 new startups, and 800 new commercial products in 2016. This is the power of innovation and IP protection. Intellectual property protection, it is so important to me and to others in this administration, and increasingly important to governments around the world. From the start of the Republic, in fact, intellectual property has been the engine behind America's economic and cultural development. Recognizing the importance, our founders included intellectual property rights in the Constitution in itself, as many of you in this room know. In fact, in the body of the Constitution, leaving aside the amendments, so in the body of the Constitution itself, the word right is mentioned only once. Did you know that, Professor? Only once. And it is in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, the IP Clause, granting to Congress power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Our greatest inventors have always been backed by our patent system. And it is within the context of that patent system that they have been able to change the world. Economists and other scholars confirm the importance of contributions from patents and other forms of IP to innovation and economic growth. In their la last update of US IP intensive industries, the USPTO's chief econ economist and his team in conjunction with colleagues at the Department of Commerce, found that IP-intensive industries directly and indirectly supported 45.5 million jobs, nearly one-third of all U.S. employment. The share of total U.S. GDP attributable to IP-intensive industries was 38.2% in 2014, and it's been growing since. Also, Private wage and salary workers in IP-intensive industries continue to earn significantly more than those in non-IP-intensive industries. In 2014, for example, workers in IP-intensive industries earned an average weekly salary of $1,312, which was 46% higher than the 896 average weekly wages in non-IP-intensive industries in the private sector. A paper by a former USPTO Edison scholar presents causal evidence that patents help startups create jobs, grow their sales, and reward their investors. Specifically, that paper found that the approval of a startup's first patent application, just the first patent application, increases its employment growth over the next five years by a remarkable 
36 percentage points on average, and the effect on sales growth is even higher. This and other studies show that entrepreneurs use patents to gain competitive advantage, secure financing, and enhance reputations. Researchers determine that the patent protection premium motivates U.S. companies to invest 33% more in R&D than they would otherwise if patent protection was eliminated. Likewise, data from the U.S. Department of Commerce shows that licensing and other revenue derived from the use of intellectual property generated a positive trade surplus for the United States of more than $80 billion in 2016. But for the IP system to work as intended, we must make sure that our IP laws and the IP rights we issue are predictable, reliable, and of high quality. At the USPTO, we are laser focused on this and are currently addressing issues that drive towards such improvements. One major area where we are concentrating our efforts is subject matter eligibility, Section 101 of the Patent Code. The Supreme Court has said that patent claims directed to laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas are not eligible for patenting. patenting. This has led to significant confusion regarding what exactly is meant by an abstract idea, for example, and what does directed to mean. Yes, it turns out that abstract ideas are quite abstract. <laughs> Similar issues arise when it comes to diagnostics and biopharma-related applications. We are currently working on new guidance to clarify all of this for our examiners, applicants, and the public. Furthermore, once a patent is issued, it is important for everyone, the patent owner, competitors, industry, and the public at large, to be able to reasonably rely on the patent grant. And to that end, we are working to assure all post-grant proceedings at the USPTO are balanced and that they meet the congressional in intent of the America Invents Act, which Congress passed in 2012. We are also taking a broad, fresh look at all of our IT systems and to ensure that our legacy systems that we use at the PTO are modernized and to transition the USPTO to state-of-the-art technology. And relatedly, in order to improve the quality of the patent examination and the quality of the patent rights that we issue in the first place, we are looking at artificial intelligence technologies to surface upfront during examination the most relevant prior art. You know, several administrations ago, President Eisenhower noted in his first inaugural address that, quote, love of liberty means the guarding of every resource that makes freedom possible, from the sanctity of our families and the wealth of our soil to the genius of our scientists and I would add, to the genius of our inventors. Our inventors are a national treasure, from Thomas Edison to Boyer and Cohen for recombinant DNA. These are our national heroes. Protecting the fruits of the genius, imagination, creativity, and determination of our nation's scientists, inventors, and entrepreneurs, that is what we do, and that is what we focus on at the USPTO every day. Day in and day out, our patent examiners work together with inventors to help them secure intellectual property rights for their ideas that lead to not only new products, but also to employment opportunities and the strong all-around U.S. economy. In 1859, Abraham Lincoln, by the way, the only U.S. president to hold the patent, recognize the importance of a robust patent system. And he said that the patent system added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. Inventors and entrepreneurs, like all of you and all of you who work with the folks around this great university, they are at the heart of the system, making it all possible and we at the USPTO know that and remember that 
each and every day. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you, and I look forward to our panel discussion and any questions you might all have. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Bryce Pels. I'm the Director of Licensing here at the University of Michigan's High Transfer Office. And I'm the one that's been lucky enough to sit closest to this amazing panel. Um, Director Yonker, we thank you for those great remarks. Um, we've already heard from him. Joining him on the panel is Professor Becky Eisenberg um, from the University of Michigan Law School. Um, Professor Eisenberg has been at the forefront of intellectual property and biopharmaceutical research. Um, she has taught at the University of Michigan Law School since 1984 as the Robert and Barbara Luciano Professor of Law and regularly teaches and writes on patent law, trademark law, and FDA law. Um, I know she's taught uh, many of the leaders in patent law around the country. Uh, besides them, she also taught me. <laughs> <laughs> and it, for those that have seen a law school class, you know that when you're a first year law student, it's the professor that asks the questions, the students answer them. I can guarantee you on that day the questions were better, but today the answer is what will be better. It's a great <laughs> panel. Um, and then to Professor Eisenberg's uh, left is Mark Ringus. Mark is uh, Vice President and Assistant General Counsel at IBM. The most important thing to know about Mark is he's a double Michigan alum, graduating from undergrad and then Michigan Law School. After graduating from the Big Blue, he went to work at the other Big Blue, IBM. Um, and you know, Mark and IBM more generally have been strong advocates for a sound, fair, and balanced patent system. In a recent brief to the Supreme Court, uh, they pointed out that IBM has been the largest recipient of patents for the last 25 years running. And they really do have a, a unique perspective on the patent system because they're both a large patent holder, they're a plaintiff in lawsuits, they're a defendant in lawsuits, there's a they're a licensor, they're a licensee, and their technologies and products really span the, the gamut of technology and innovation. Um, so they really have been at the forefront of advocating um, for a strong, fair, and balanced patent system. So Mark, we're glad to have you back in Arbor here today. So maybe to start us off, one of the, the primary goals of the patent system is to incentivize innovation. Um, we'll get to some of the challenges in a bit, but maybe to start off, can we talk about ways in which the patent system is working, in your view, to incentivize innovation? Maybe Director Bianco, can we start with you? Sure. Um, first of all, I would like to know how he did in your class. <laughs> <laughs> Not good enough to get off campus. <laughs> So um, the genius of the patent system is that, in my view, it's a perpetual innovation machine. So first of all, it um, provides protection for the inventor's ideas so that the inventors feel comfortable with disclosing those ideas to the public and uh, commercializing, whether themselves or somebody they license, uh, commercializing the idea and creating new technology. It provides the protection and the incentive to make the investments in developing new technologies. At the same time, the patent system incentivizes competition. I view the patents as being pro-competitive. Um, and the way they do that is uh, uh, humans are of infinite ingenuity and inventiveness. So if I see uh, Mark's product uh, uh, that it does well, I want to participate in that space as well. Unfortunately, and perhaps annoyingly for now, he has a patent and I can't participate right now. And as a result of the fact that he has protection on exactly what he's doing and how he's doing it, I put research and development dollars in innovating around and perhaps doing one better. So now I invent the next best thing that keeps him on his toes as well to keep innovating likewise. So I think the patent system, when it's well balanced, when it provi 
when it provides reliable and predictable guidelines is an amazing system that, uh, th that continuously incentivizes investment in innovation and increasing innovation and uh, improvements in, in the state of technology. Thanks. Professor Eisenberg? So it's great. Those of us who, um, who are primarily commentators tend to dwell on the things that are wrong with the patent system. It's nice to be prompted uh, to talk about what's working uh, uh, well uh, in, in the patent system. Uh, in the area that I focus on, biopharmaceutical innovation, I think there's no question uh, that patent protection uh, motivates um, uh, a lot of private investments in developing new products and bringing them to market, investments that would otherwise not be uh, profitable uh, or possible. Um, they also, of course, get a lot of the blame for the high prices of uh, new drugs, and these are flip sides of, of the same coin. The way that patents do their magic, the way they motivate investment is by making it profitable, and the way they make it profitable is by allowing uh, the exclusion of competitors and therefore charging uh, uh, higher prices. So it becomes very important to use the patent system uh, with care, uh, allowing patents on worthy inventions uh, uh, that, that deserve it, um, and uh, rejecting patent applications on unworthy inventions that are obvious or otherwise fail to meet the standards for, for uh, patent protection. And uh, the Patent and Trademark Office is uh, the best place to make those assessments. It's, it's the first place to make those assessments. And um, uh, recently, Congress has enlarged the role of the, the PTO uh, in assessing the patentability of inventions by creating uh, new processes uh, uh, within the PTO to reconsider uh, the patentability of certain patents that are challenged uh, uh, as uh, invalid um, uh, uh, and to have that happen before an expert tribunal that can decide the matter more quickly and at lower cost uh, than if the parties had to go to uh, litigation. This is a, a really good promising new development uh, that has raised a lot of new questions uh, about the relationship between the PTO uh, and, and the courts. There's been a lot of issues that the, uh, that, that the Patent Office has uh, uh, been uh, working through about these proceedings. Um, they made some uh, controversial moves in implementing uh, these new authorities, but I think basically that they're, they're doing a great job. Uh, so I think that's uh, uh, the, uh, in, in addition to saying that the Patent Office is working well, I want to emphasize the important role of the PTO in implementing patent law and the importance of allowing them to do that, giving them the, the, the deference uh, that they often don't get um, uh, in the courts uh, for their decisions. Well, thank you. Uh, let me first start by, by noting that one of my greatest regrets from my uh, time at law school here in Michigan was not taking Professor Eisenberg's course. Uh, uh, I, uh, I came to IP law only late in my, uh, my career at IBM and uh, did, not, uh, did not focus on that during my uh, law school, uh, period of time at law school. But let me start out by saying that uh, many uh, in the industry uh, will assert that uh, the patent system is broken. You'll hear that time and time again. I can tell you uh, personally, and uh, I can tell you IBM Corporation disagrees with that wholeheartedly. Uh, we are, as Bryce mentioned, we've been leading uh, uh, in a number of U.S. patents issued for 25 consecutive years. Uh, the last time we checked the statistics, we're confident that we're going to be 26 years. Uh, we'd like to remind Director Yanku that we're uh, his largest customer. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, we, we have a great respect for the U.S. patent system. We think it drives innovation. Uh, we certainly invest significant amounts of money uh, 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 applying for and prosecuting patents. Uh, they drive great value for our company uh, and, uh, and we think drive great value for the U.S. economy. Uh, now, is the patent system perfect? No. Uh, it can be improved and has been improved over time. We were, we were uh, significant supporters of the American Amendments Act, uh, which came into, into effect in 2012. Uh, there are a number of significant changes, as Professor Eisenberg said, uh, hopefully driving better quality patents uh, and leading to uh, more uh, predictability and credibility uh, in the patent system. Uh, the, some of the new processes, like the third-party submission process, uh, we think is a great addition that adds value and uh, drives for high-quality patents. So there are a number of great things that happen in the U.S. patent system, uh, and those things are happening e even as we speak. I know Director Nanku has been working on, 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 on tweaking the post-grant system. Uh, uh, and uh, making some significant changes there. Um, we think there are many improvements uh, that have been made and continue to be made. 
things like uh, uh, guidance to uh, uh, patent trial and appeal board judges on uh, how to what, what to do in denying um, uh, petitions that uh, that rely on the same or similar prior art that the, 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 the other petitions have. Um, uh, some additional guidance on precedential uh, uh, decisions coming out of the PTAP. Uh, there are wonderful things going on in the Patent Office, and we think this uh, having a very important impact on innovation, certainly in the U.S. economy. Bryce, that was a very good question you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, we can wrap this up and move to the next round. <laughs> it's rare that uh, we hear wonderful things about uh, what the government is doing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I agree. Great. So the, the, the patent system has a, a long history of incentivizing innovation. Um, in the last several years, we've seen some pretty significant changes. You mentioned the American Vents Act. There have been some really you know, seismic um, court decisions from the Supreme Court and the federal circuits. Um, from your perspectives, have you seen any negative impacts of these changes to the incentive to innovate? And maybe, Director Iancu, I'll start with you. Um, you mentioned Section 101 and patent eligibility in your remarks. I know you gave some remarks to the Intellectual Property Owners Association a few weeks ago. Can you talk about you know, what is the issue with 101 and patent eligibility and the role the PTO is playing in that? Sure. Um, Section 101 has become substantively one of the most important areas of uh, patent law right now. Um, and um, so Section 101 is the section of the patent code that defines, broadly speaking, what types of subject matter are actually eligible for patenting. And it gives four categories, process, machine, manufacture, and composition of matter. That section was literally written in almost identical terms by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison for the 1793 Patent Act. That section has not materially changed since then. Of course, there have been some improvements in the types of technologies that we're dealing with right now uh, as compared to 1793. What's happened in the meantime, though, is that the courts, in the, in, in the absence of any legislative changes for 200 some years, the courts have spoken on this section. And instead of adding or to the subject matter that is eligible, or instead of redefining the categories, or interpreting the, name, the meaning of the four categories, the courts have found exclusions from the four categories. And, are the, and the exclusions are the three categories I have mentioned, which is uh, products of nature, natural phenomena, and uh, abstract ideas. There have been a series of cases recently, in the past five years or so, that have created confusion as to some of these categories mean. And in particular, that confusion arises primarily around the abstract ideas area. And what's unclear very often is whether a particular claim, depending how it is written, is within the exclusion or not. Is, it sub is the subject matter eligible for patenting or not? The courts have not drawn clear lines. And just a few examples, just as an example, not to take any bigger meaning from it, but I'll give one example, which is computer databases. One day, the Federal Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals for Patents, the Federal Circuit finds that computer databases are eligible, depending how the claims are written. And on a different day, a different case, the Court finds that the same subject matter, computer databases, are not eligible, depending how the claim is written. And we have 8,500 examiners at the PTO that are trying to apply these laws, these case, the laws of the cases, and trying to draw these distinctions on claim after claim after claim, because they see thousands of applications. And it's very difficult to figure out, in the example of a database, is it more like this case that's eligible, or is it more like the other case that's not eligible? And they're having difficulty, judges are having difficulty, and practitioners and inventors are having difficulty, and there are many, many examples like this. So what we are trying to do at the PTO is to provide 
more clear guidance to our examiners. And once we do that, hopefully the courts will uh, take a look at that as well. And not allow a discussion of um, eligibility that is determined claim by claim. Section 101 is about subject matter. And the question should be asked, is the subject matter, broadly speaking, eligible or not eligible? We need to know, are computer databases, broadly speaking, eligible or not eligible? And then, once we know whether they're in or out, then we can apply the statutory basis for patentability. Once we know that they're eligible, then we can apply a statutory basis for patentability. Section 102, novelty. Section 103, obviousness. Section 112, various criteria of, patentab of, of patentability to determine whether they are patentable. There is a meaningful distinction between eligibility, which is in Section 101 on the one hand, and patentability. Sections 102, 103, 112 of the code on the other hand. And we need to keep these things separate. So what we want to do is to synthesize the many cases that have come down and tell the examiners, here are the handful of categories which are not eligible. And if they're not in this category, if the claim before you is not in this category, then you can move on, be done with 101, and go to 102, 103, 112 analyses for patentability. It's much more complex than that. I'm keeping it at a fairly high level. Um, but uh, at least we're trying to do that. And we'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, then it could be that the only next alternative is um, uh, legislative changes to Section 101. As I said, it hasn't happened in 200 some years. Uh, there are proposals out there, IPO, AIPLA, others, the American Bar Association too, have proposals for legislative changes. Um, uh, who knows where that effort is going to go. But at least from the PTO's point of view, we can try to do it, uh, clarify a little bit with some guidance. Great. Professor Eisenberg, while we're on the topics of patent eligibility, yeah, comments? Sure. sure. Well, I basically agree with uh, uh, Director Yanku's criticisms of the uh, uh, recent jurisprudence on, on patentable subject matter. Um, uh, and I sympathize with what you're trying to do uh, to turn that, that ship around, although I worry that these guidelines uh, may not survive uh, judicial review. And this is why one of the things that, you know, most of my criticisms of uh, the, the way the patent system is functioning are directed at the courts. Um, and I think that judicial review is not as deferential as it needs to be in order to uh, allow the PTO to figure out uh, uh, how to make the, the, the patent system function effectively. You are the front lines of seeing what people are inventing and what they're bringing into the uh, uh, PTO. Um, so I would direct my attention at the scope of judicial review, although it's a tricky thing to uh, uh, address. In many technical areas of the law, reviewing courts um, uh, give considerable deference to the decisions of expert agencies uh, uh, that are charged with administering the law, uh, and the administrative state really couldn't function well uh, without uh, uh, that, that deference. Uh, but patent law has been different, partly because it's, it's existed since long prior to the Administrative Procedure Act, and the, uh, also because the Federal Circuit has greatly resisted deferring uh, to the PTO uh, on uh, decisions large and small, um, uh, but particularly on matters of interpreting uh, the requirements of, of patent law. The Supreme Court has sometimes shown more willingness to defer uh, to the PTO, but I wouldn't expect a lot of deference on the issue of patentable subject matter. I think they believe that uh, uh, the PTO is aligned with the forces of darkness on this and that they have seen the light, uh, and I, I do not hold out high hopes that if the the Federal Circuit decides not to uh, 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 defer to your guidelines. They would, they would never say they were deferring, but not to um, accept your guidelines um, uh, as, as consistent with their vision of the law. Uh, I, I think it's very unlikely that the, that the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, would do it. So my, my expectation is that we're going to need uh, uh, legislation. And if we were writing new legislation on patentable subject matter, uh, I might be more ambitious uh, than the guidelines that you're trying to do within the scope of, 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 of current law. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, if I, it, you know I, I get have the, of course the 
privilege of writing law review articles rather than guidance documents. It's a very different uh, art form. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I would say, well, gee whiz, if the point of the uh, uh, Supreme Court's uh, limitations on patentable subject matter is to preserve free access uh, to the basic building blocks of science and technology, which is always what they say they're trying to do, you don't necessarily need to make this a patent-free zone. Uh, maybe rather than having a, a, a validity doctor, uh, doctrine that, that limits what can be patented, maybe we should limit the acts that count as infringement. In other words, rather than saying that these inventions are not patentable because they're the, the wrong kind of subject matter um, and because they're basic building blocks of science and technology, maybe we could have a more robust infringement doctrine uh, that, that, that provides a defense for subsequent innovators who were using these basic inventions as building blocks uh, to make further scientific and technological uh, inventions. This has a number of, of uh, advantages, including that you deal with patentable subject matter. You deal with a limitation at the back end rather than at the front end. It doesn't become a reason to deny the patent in the first place. Um, and then also you can tailor the defense to the interests that they're trying to serve uh, through these uh, subject matter exclusions. Um, but uh, that wouldn't work uh, 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 for the, your, your guidance documents at this point. But I, I don't hold out high hopes that, uh, 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 that, that, that this is going to be something that can be uh, fixed administratively, although I wish that it were. I wish that there would be more deference to that sort of policy making from the PTO. Thank you. And Mark, any thoughts on pen eligibility from uh, IBM's perspective? Lots, lots of thoughts on pen eligibility. <laughs> um, let me start out by uh, actually, uh, commenting that uh, I think Director Yonke's approach to the Patent Office is an excellent approach. Uh, and, and, and the Patent Office has to deal with these issues every day. And, uh, the, the situation that's uh, driven by the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court is, is really untenable and it puts uh, the Patent Office and the Patent Examiners in a very, very difficult position. I can just note that four of our Federal uh, Circuit Court judges uh, have commented in opinions in the last year that they find the current jurisprudence on Section 101 uh, unworkable and impossible to manage. Uh, it has become a huge problem uh, for, uh, for American industry um, and in, in particular areas where uh, it's extremely important for our industry to grow and to invest and innovate. Um, abstract ideas plays right into the heart of software innovation and software innovation plays in just about every product uh, that, uh, that, that is manufactured in the, in the, in, or, or used in the U.S. economy. From automobiles to refrigerators, uh, there is software in everything we deal with and whether or not the innovations in that software is patentable is critical to uh, U.S. manufacturers and U.S. industry. Uh, and, and so that is a big problem. A another area which is, which is very sensitive in this area is artificial intelligence. Uh, that is an area that we, that, that IBM invests in greatly. And th the question rises now uh, with, the, with the current jurisprudence, are our, our innovations in the area of art artificial intelligence, intelligence considered abstract ideas and not patentable subject matter. It is, it is a, a significant issue for us, and it's interesting to see how that is developing in, in the patent offices outside uh, the United States. Uh, certainly, uh, the innovation uh, and the, the uh, focus and the investment in countries like China in artificial intelligence is significant. Uh, China gets right now three times more patents in artificial intelligence than are issued by the U.S. Patent Office. 48% uh, of the investment uh, made in artificial intelligence is now made in China for startup corporations rather than in the United States. I think some of that has to do with the uncertainty and unreliability of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, in the area of Section 101. So it's an area that we think needs to, to be very closely looked at by the legislature. Uh, the, the, the Federal Circuit judges have told us uh, at least several of them have told, them that they have told us that this is something they don't believe they can fix. Uh, we believe that a legislative fix is, is certainly needed, and the sooner we can do that, the better. I understand that uh, Washington seems to be uh, directed in a number of other areas these days, and not necessarily focused on this issue. But this is an issue that's important for the U.S. economy, and important for creating jobs in the U.S., and it's one that we certainly believe uh, that needs some focus by, uh, by the U.S. Congress. Just to address a couple of things um, that have been said, I agree with all that. I think um, folks need to be extremely attentive to this Section 101 issue and eligibility. Uh, it might seem like an obscure area of a small corner of one 
statute. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that it is an overhang over the, it hangs over the entire system and the entire innovation ecosystem. If you don't know, resources are limited, and if you don't know where to invest your resources because you don't know whether it will be protected or not, you might choose to invest your resources elsewhere. What's critically important to realize is that we are in an increasingly competitive global marketplace. And you're right, China is very hot on these issues, and they have figured out that they need a strong patent system. They've been working at it for several years now. They have dramatically increased their IP protections and importantly, dramatically increased innovation uh, in all of these spaces. And they're not making a secret out of it. They have a plan that's public, that's out there, and they're delivering on that plan. So not only China, but China, Japan, Europe, they have figured out some years ago the eligibility question, where the lines are drawn. We are still fighting the issue, unlike any other district of major jurisdiction in the world. We're the last ones of the major jurisdictions for innovation that is still fighting this question. It is so important uh, across the board. I agree also with the professor that who knows what, this, what the courts will do with the guidance that the administration might put forward. Um, but I am not as pessimistic. Uh, the fact is that the Supreme Court itself, just look at the Supreme Court, has looked at this section for 220 some years, really from the beginning of the statute. And again, the statute hasn't really changed. In all that time, they only found three things to be ineligible. And by the way, databases, it's just one example, not to pick on that, but just as an example, was not one of them. And not many, many other things. The only three things, and that is natural phenomena like electromagnetism or gravity and things like that, or products of nature, DNA cells naturally occurring in a human body, blood, whatever. Okay? Those I combine as one. Second, mathematics. <coughs> they don't like math. Okay? <laughs> or, or whatever reason. There are several cases from the Supreme Court that say math by itself, unapplied, doesn't do anything, therefore not eligible. And the third thing is fundamental economic practices, again, by themselves, per se, not within technology. Those are the three things. And expressly they cautioned, Justice Thomas in the Alice decision just a couple of years ago, expressly cautioned. Don't overread our cases, because if you do, you will swallow all of patent law. And unfortunately, what we have all done since, we have overread their cases and have swallowed up all of patent law. And I'm just hopeful, don't know if it's going to be, I'm just a little bit optimistic, that if we go back to their precise pronouncement, of the specific things that they found over 228 years and not much more beyond that, and we don't overread their cases, that they will agree with us. So we'll, that remains to be seen. Thank you. So we've covered uh, Section 101 and patent eligibility. I think we basically solved the problem. Um, <laughs> are there other areas out there where you've seen the recent changes have a negative impact on the incentive to innovate? Um, any other tweaks to the patent laws that we'd like to see? Um, I, I can comment on a, uh, a, a couple a couple cases. Um, uh, as, as Professor Eisenberg said, the, 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 the issues are more in the courts these days. I don't know that we've had any significant patent legislation since the AIA. Uh, certainly, Congress has considered uh, a, a number of things, but I don't know that anything has actually passed and made law. Uh, there are a couple cases uh, uh, that I'd like to highlight. One is the Impression Products case versus Lexmark, where uh, the uh, Supreme Court decided that a sale of a product uh, outside the U.S. exhausts U.S. patents. Uh, that is a unique decision. It's contrary to uh, the patent law in many other countries. Uh, and it really uh, devalues U.S. patents by, in essence, saying that something happening overseas actually has an impact on the value of U.S. patents here in the United States. So that's a case that is of concern, uh, I think, particularly of concern to our pharmaceutical companies. 
uh, that, uh, that that rely so much on patents to protect their products. And uh, sales outside the U.S. means that those products can come in into the U.S. without the protection of, uh, of U.S. patents. So that's that's an issue that I think something that needs to be considered and addressed. Uh, another case that I'll mention is the Helsa versus Teva Te 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 case, which is before the Supreme Court. Uh, as we speak, and hopefully we'll get a decision sometime in the next few months on that. And that really has to do with uh, a, a confidential uh, a sale of, of, of uh, an invention uh, is, is considered prior art, which could impact uh, uh, patentability. Uh, uh, that's an issue which really impacts how parties collaborate uh, in the early stages of uh, research and development and invention. And, uh, um, and we'll be watching that case very carefully with the hope that the Supreme Court makes a decision that's consistent with allowing companies to, uh, uh, to work together and collaborate in those early stages without impacting the uh, patentability of the uh, innovations that they develop. So I want to come back to this issue of judicial review because I think it's really, uh, uh, really important. Uh, not just in the you know review of policy making and guidance documents and so forth, but uh, review of the routine decisions that get made by the PTO in administering the patent system and deciding whether to grant or or, or not, and deciding whether to um, uh, 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 invalidate in the course of these PTAB proceedings. Uh, the Federal Circuit has never wanted to defer to the PTO on any decision whatsoever, um, although the, the Supreme. Supreme Court has sometimes said, no, you must defer to PTO fact-finding. Um, but um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, one of the power moves that the, the, the Federal Circuit made in order to consolidate its control of the patent system some 30 years ago was to code many of the most important issues in patent law as pure conclusions of law subject to plenary review on appeal. And there are many issues in patent laws in any field of law that are mixed questions of law, in fact, uh, that they code as subject to plenary review on appeal. Um, uh, including claim interpretation and uh, non-obviousness, uh, 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 many issues that lurk behind the, uh, uh, other uh, rulings. Um, and uh, 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 I, I think this is uh, something that uh, limits the ability of uh, the PTO uh, to take charge of uh, the quality control in the patent system through these PTAP proceedings, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board proceedings, which I think is a really important development that Congress in the America Invents Act intended to um, uh, make this, uh, uh, you know, provide this quicker, uh, more expert, uh, ch cheaper uh, administrative proceeding for adjudicating these challenges. Um, and uh, active judicial review and frequent uh, 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 reversals and remands slow things down, make it more expensive, and defeat uh, the purpose of uh, moving these uh, disputes to an expert agency rather than an inexpert uh, uh, trial court. Um, now, there's not really a whole lot that the PTO can do about um, uh, uh, judicial review standards, but the, but the Supreme Court, I think, has shown uh, a lot of willingness to look to the views of the PTO in considering when should it be granting review. And so sometimes you can play a role in queuing up cases for uh, a, a Supreme Court review in weighing in on a, a cert petition and whether it should be uh, granted. And I would really like to see uh, some uh, uh, greater uh, uh, deference to, to PTO decisions um, uh, uh, through um, uh, maybe revisiting some of these um, uh, uh, rulings on what counts as a legal conclusion and what counts as, as, as fact-finding uh, in patent law. Director Ackie, or anything? Well, um, given in the interest of time, so first of all, I agree. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you could run for office or be on the court, <laughs> figure out a way to uh, give the PTO a uh, substantive rulemaking uh, authority or substantive and, and combined with substantive uh, deference, that would be yeah. great. Um, but um, in addition to what's been mentioned, um, I do believe that there have been some repercussions from the America Invents Act uh, that have caused some. Uh, problems in the IP system and some instability. Uh, just very briefly, uh, the post-grant review process that was established by the AIA, and, um, you know, the way it was uh, implemented to some extent was, in my view, an overcorrection that uh, resulted in 
more patents being eliminated at the patent office than in district court. So there, they, we ended up with this uh, dichotomy where the PTO, uh, it was easier to invalidate patents at the PTO than in the district courts, all in the name of eliminating from the system what's called, quote, bad patents, close quote. But there's a question that I've always had. If a patent survives challenge in an Article III district court proceeding, how can that be a bad patent? Whatever a bad patent mean, in my mind, it cannot possibly be one of those that survives challenge in an Article III adjudica uh, adjudication. So to have broader standards in the administration for invalidating patents than in the district court uh, seemed like an overcorrection to me. So, uh, the, so some of the things we're doing now is to go back to balance and try to line up uh, the systems that we have in the district in the PTO with uh, with the district court. Um, I could go on on, on some of these issues, but uh, that's that's at the highest level uh, from what we are doing at the PTO. Great, thank you. Well, this has been great. I want to give um, each person a chance to uh, give some final thoughts. And before we give uh, Director Iancu the, the final word here, uh, maybe Mark and Professor Eisenberg, do you have any words of, for, of encouragement for a new or relatively new director of the PTO on the importance of that role in protecting inventors and incentivizing innovation? I think you're doing great. I, I'm totally with you on the broadest reasonable interpretation, which I think is what you were referring to, uh, changing the standards for claim interpretation in these challenges to conform to the, it's, it's unfair to apply a, 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 a different standard in these administrative proceedings and would be applied in, in, in the district court. So I'm completely in agreement with that. Uh, I think, um, it, you know, in the past, the, the PTO has had uh, the most impact through its, its control of uh, examiners, um, and I think that's the way you're, you're, you're focusing, and uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's the, the, the right way to go. Um, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged. Um, I think you're, you're doing great. Uh, I share that, uh, that sentiment as well. Um, uh, you're focusing on the issues of predictability and reliability, which I think is essential to U.S. industry, uh, and it's essential to an effective patent system. So that's something that we, we, we really uh, strongly support and that we believe is, is absolutely uh, necessary. Um, uh, a couple thoughts on, on things that could improve, uh, uh, and I, I know you're working on many of them as well. Um, one, the one that we see all the time is the, the gap between um, the prior art that is discovered and uncovered in the patent office by the examiners and the prior art that is uncovered and discovered through the litigation process or even the post-grant uh, review processes. Uh, there is a significant difference there. And I, I think the, the, the biggest challenge is the lack of tools that are available to our patent examiners. I, I know uh, Director Yanko is working on improving those tools. Uh, he mentioned that in his opening remarks. We think that's absolutely necessary uh, to drive higher quality patents and, 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 and actually uh, uh, reach uh, uh, limiting that gap between what we see in litigation and we see in the patent office. And the second, second thing that uh, we, we see uh, uh, fairly regularly is, is, is uh, issues around compact prosecution. Uh, the, the, the goal of the patent office, as I understand it, is to, to share all the issues in the, in the first office action with, uh, with the, the, the patent applicant uh, to make sure that they understand where the issues are and the, the concerns that the examiner has. Um, we're not necessarily seeing that as often as we like it, and we think that's an area of, of some improvement. But setting aside those, those issues, we think Director Yanko is really a breath of, breath of fresh air and adding a lot of value uh, and really redirecting the patent office in a way which will, uh, will help and, uh, and greatly support U.S. innovation. Great. Well, Director Yanko, on behalf of research universities and organizations around the country, Thank you for looking out for our amazing inventors, many of which are in the, the room today. Um, so you have a room full of inventors, students, entrepreneurs, investors, academics. Um, do you have any words for advice on our role in promoting a healthy patent system and then any other closing remarks? Absolutely. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, and thank you, both of you, for those uh, kind comments. Um, and uh, thanks to the university for inviting me here and for uh, doing this with Anderson as an annual uh, innovation uh, events, which I think is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it really is uh, the backbone of our economy. Um, you know, one of the uh, uh, 
major overarching issues that I think have harmed the IP system in the United States and innovation is the overall negative rhetoric that has taken place in this country surrounding the patent system over the past decade or frankly even more than that. Um, and uh, it often happens that um, uh, nowadays you mention patents and there's you know, somewhat of a visceral negative reaction. And to me that is A, so sad, but uh, B, uh, not good for, uh, for, uh, for, for the country. Um, the fact of the matter is that when I think of patents, I think of Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers and the folks who uh, are like at this university in labs on a daily basis and come up with amazing stuff that treats cancer and so many diseases and changes the world. Um, and when people talk about patents, those are the images that come to my mind. And when kids are thinking about what they want to do when they grow up. They need to have cre clear, clearly defined heroes in their minds. And if we can instill in their minds that the heroes are the scientists and the inventors that forever in this country have moved us forward and right now are in their labs and in their, in, in, in their workplaces at universities and research and development labs across the country, making changes. If they want to grow up and be those people, I think we will be in great shape. So my hope is that with all of your work, uh, and you have a great platform from here, you have a platform not just to do the innovation, but to advocate for innovation and to publish and to speak publicly and to advocate for innovation and for inventors and for the IP system that backs it all. If we can do that, I think we will ensure that the next generation will grow up in bigger numbers to be just like the folks in this room. And I do think that, that those are the things that will move this country forward and those are the things that will keep this country at the forefront uh, of the world economy. So anyway, once again, thank you very much for everything you do on those issues and for having, uh, for having us here today. Great. Please join me in thanking this panel. <laughs> so thanks again to the panelists. At this point, please join us for the celebration of events.